I'm Tracy. And I'm Sharon. And we are Feet of Clay. Confessions of the Cult Sisters. And do we have some confessions of some cult sisters today? (laughs) Yes, we do. A different sister and a different cult. But oh my God, it's kind of like same song, different verse, huh, Tracy? Very much so. Hey, listeners, we wanted to give you a heads up that in this episode, we will be discussing very disturbing topics such as arranged child marriages, domestic abuse, as well as physical and sexual assault. Please use discretion when listening and take care of yourself. Very much so. And we like our sisters. So welcome, Abigail, to the Confessions of the Cult Sisters. I already feel bonded with you. It's great to be here. I'm super excited to be back again with you guys. All right. Well, folks, if you missed it, you should go back and listen to the last episode where Abigail told us about her childhood and growing up. And now we're going to kind of pick things up in the teen years. And that's where things get a little hot and steamy and more fraught with all this shit that got heaped on all of us. So Yes. If we were Troy and Brian at this point, we would say, Abigail, were (laughs) you a teenage fundamentalist? (laughs) Absolutely. Yes. It doesn't get a lot more fundy than me. (laughs) That's true. I think you did out fundy us for sure. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Abigail, bring us back to your teen years and how that all played out. Yeah. So I think the crazy thing about being in the IBLP is that all the rules suddenly change right when you're about 13 years old as a girl. How how do you mean? What, What changes? So IBLP kind of follows the kind of Old Testament belief system that children are adults at 12 or 13 years old, depending on gender. So for girls, 13. Wow. And all your rules change. You are suddenly now a sexual object. Mm -hmm. You are suddenly now your purity culture and modesty requirements change even to more extreme than they were as a child. Your conduct needs to change. You are not allowed to have unchaperoned interactions with boys at all in any scenario. Everything changes Is there like a a ritual or a talking about it or a, hey, sit down, or is it like just a expected gradual shift? How how does that take place? I think we're pretty, pretty taught to that rhythm from the time we're very little. So we know it's coming. I I Mm. think it's something that is usually met with some form of excitement and anticipation. There are things that you weren't allowed to participate in as a child that you're now allowed to participate in as a quote unquote adult, which is still a child. Wait, 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 wait. At 12 and 13, they're calling you an adult? Yes. So so IBLP doesn't believe in teenagers. Teenagers are a thing that Satan created. So (laughs) yeah, you're either a child or you're an adult. It's kind of like the entry wow. fee to um, amusement parks. You're either a child or you're an adult. <laughs> and it really is at that cutoff. Right. You either get chicken fingers or you don't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the Happy Meal. Yeah. Happy Meal or a Big Mac. Okay, then. Right. And Sharon, in you know Judaism, they have the bat mitzvahs or the bar mitzvahs of this coming into, I think what yeah. we would have called it is age of accountability. Yeah, super similar. But I know, but that's just, I, I'm surprised. I'm, I'm just kind of a little bit shocked. I'm, I'm trying to- I mean, it's gross. Like it's super, super gross. Yeah. And so like you can join like the bell choir and you can join the adult orchestra and you can join, you know, then you're, you're segregated even more by gender at this point. So our kind of answer to youth group was this thing called impact. And that's not all IBLP. That's just our particular church. What was the name of your church? Calvary Baptist in Smyrna, Georgia. And it still exists in much the same form it did when I was there. So it's still IBLP? Yes, and same pastor as as when I was growing up. Okay. We would go to Impact, which sometimes the Impact group would meet together, meaning boys and girls, 
but you, there was like an aisle way and, and the boys sat on one side and the girls sat on the other side always. Mm -hmm. And then often we were separated. And when we were separated from what I've been able to piece together um, by talking to my brother and other boys who were there is that the boys were pretty much began their grooming for uh, being finite godly leaders. So uh, as my brother puts it, groomed to be abusers. And girls were, of course, uh, almost 100% of our curriculum was purity culture and modesty and not causing our brother to stumble and how if we wore something or said something or did something and it caused the boys to think about us in a sexualized way, that was 100% our responsibility. Mm. It really can't be overstated how, how much that was taught. It was almost exclusively what was being taught. And I was a, a late blooming child. So at 13, I still looked very much like a child. Um, and I really looked very much like a child until I was 16 coming 17. And then all of a sudden, in like a six month period of time, I grew six inches and I was a very curvy girl. So um, I actually happened to know my measurements at that time, which was 36, 18, 30. Oh wow. So I just looked like Marilyn <laughs> Monroe all the time. Yeah. <laughs> and it was horrible. Mm. I cannot describe mm. to you the body dysmorphia, the hatred of, of my, my body. It is so hard to describe it because it was so not in keeping with the purity culture that we were being taught within the IBLP. There was just almost nothing I could do to not look sexy. It just, by their standards. You know what, Abigail, I, I'm sitting here and I just realized like my mouth is just kind of dropped open. Yeah. Because I am like, mm. and I, I don't know, I've, I've got this like, this weird tingling in my body, just trying to imagine this. It is a different experience than Tracy or I had. Didn't feel shamed about our bodies transforming into women. And I'm just putting myself in your position where you've been taught and conditioned that anything in any way sexual about you is a temptation, that you're going to be a stumbling block to your brothers. Therefore, you are the source of sin. Mm -hmm. You are the one responsible and you're blossoming and you're growing breasts and you're at this phase in your life where you should be rejoicing and happy about what's happening in your body. And you instead, it's got to become a self-loathing and a shame yeah. and wanting to hide it. Yes, it was hor. It was truly a horrible experience. And also compounded by the fact that that we're now talking about the late 90s, early 2000s, which was Britney Spears and Christina mm -hmm. Aguilera. And, and so even in mm. pop culture, what was being shown of women was still a very athletic, slight build. Mm -hmm. And so the body type that I had was, was not popular in any arena that, that was visible to me. Mm. And I did not know another person that had a body like mine. I don't have a body like my mother's. I have a body like my paternal grandmother. Well, she died when I was four. So no one that I knew had a body like mine, which I think would have been difficult in any upbringing. But you add in that sinfulness of the female form oh. and it was, it was devastating, just devastating. Mm. And in addition to that, there was this, it's so hard to describe. So you want to not look sexy, but at mm -hmm. the same time, the IBLP is all about this courtship betrothal idea, which is, which is just a fancy way of saying arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a meat market. It was so competitive. Well, how do you mean? How, how so? Describe that. So the way that courtship works in the IBLP and in the way it was practiced, and there's some diversity in courtship, but the general tenant is that a boy gets a vision from God or a word from God that mm -hmm. you're supposed to be his wife. 
And then he goes and talks to his dad about it. And his dad then talks to your dad about it. And then the agreement is made. Wait, before talking to you? Correct. So so the boy is the instigator, but you don't know about it as the girl. Mm. He talks to his father, who then talks to your father. The fathers make the agreement that the intention of courtship is present. And then depending on the particular accent or flavor of that courtship, the girl is then courted or wooed to see if she is in fact interested in the match. And this is where things get really very complex. Okay. I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to say, Sharon, we had this at last days ministries, take the parents out, but put in the group leader. Yes. And Sharon was already married for a lot of the time before I came, but it was almost textbook the same. Equally, I as a female could go to my group leader and say I was interested and I was still to be praying, but it was driven by whether the man felt that he had heard from God and that the leaders would bless that. And then our group leaders would talk first and then they would come to us and basically say this is approved. And then the male could start to walk with you and spend time with you. So absolutely understand that. And I think in our four-part series on purity culture, I so relate to the confusion because in one aspect, I'm being told that my body is sinful and I can't be a stumbling block. And that's when I went to the opposite extreme. I stopped taking showers, right? It's like (laughs) trying to be frumpy. And then I watched all the ones that were getting in relationships were the people that were the prettier girls. And so I was very confused. So I relate to that a lot. And there was also another level at Last Days Ministries, and that was, it wasn't just the group leaders, but it was like the leadership. And and of course, some of this happened, or maybe a lot of it happened after Keith was killed in the plane crash. And then you had, you still had this kind of trinity of Wayne and Martin and Melody. And I believe that the group leaders had to submit the whole idea of each couple to them and they'd have to pray about it and feel that it was of God and Mm -hmm. get that sanctioned. So I'm not sure maybe in some of the IBLP churches, it wasn't just the fathers, it was the, the head pastor had to be okay with it too, or did it not go that far? It was it was less about the head pastor in at least the experiences that I'm aware of. Now, my understanding is that there were some arrangements that Gothard himself had quite a lot to do with. Can I but, just say something real quick? I want to say it right now. I had a lot of fun when I was making notes. I decided I'm not going to call him Bill Gothard. I want to call him Bill Gothard. <laughs> I love it. I fully support that. <laughs> I fully support it. Uh, he, I could just picture him. Man, he got hard looking at all these young virgins, For didn't sure he? sure he did. There was no <laughs> doubt about that. Mm-hmm. Okay, sorry. I digress. <laughs> so for my experience, the senior pastor kind of, I think, passively had to not have a check in his spirit about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that all-knowing check in my spirit. <laughs> yeah, the, the magical check in the spirit. Um, mm. and And, you know... Where it got so messed up is that, in theory, a girl could veto any offer. But in reality, that's that's not really true because mm. we had been groomed from infancy that mm-hmm. our purpose in life was to be a wife and a mother. And there was a really meaningful terror of no one asking. Really? Oh. Yeah. Like a like a really meaningful terror. I hadn't even thought about that. And if no one asks, then who are you? Mm. What is your value to the kingdom? So basically, you've got to just take the first offer because you may not get another? That was kind of the unspoken truth of it all. Unless you were confident you would get multiple offers. Um, which some some of us had that privilege and some of us didn't. Mm. I was in a position of privilege, at least in that way, that that I was confident I would get the offers that I wanted. Wow. When did you get your first offer and how did that happen? 
that's where this all gets so just gross and pedo. So I, I read through my journals recently and at 12 years old is the first time people started to talk to me directly about Jonathan. People who, what, which people? His mother, my mother, random people in the church, just about that existence and about that match. And it was done in, in such a kind of subtle way that Sneaky. I don't know how else to describe it other than grooming. I, I really don't. It, it, it was grooming and it was, mm. it was subtle things like um, his mom started to spend a lot of time with me and our families started to spend time together. Oh my God. I'm just getting so creeped out right now. <laughs> it's yeah. so gross. And so he was in your church? Yes. So it was a, a church courtship, meaning we were in the same body of Christ. Okay. Had you been in any homeschool groups with him or had any in your childhood years, any kind of childhood interactions? Yeah. You know, we were um, we were both active members of the church, which was large by IBLP standards, but not large by any other standards, about 300 families. Okay. Ooh, that is kind of large. <laughs> you know, we we certainly knew each other and knew of each other. And, and I, I will tell you this, having, having reread all of that, I have absolutely no idea whether I had a crush on Jonathan or not. Mm. I have no idea. I could not tell you. Mm. It was abundantly clear from my journal entries that I was thinking about him as a potential God's plan partner for me at 12 and 13 years old. At 12? At fucking 12 years old? Yes. <laughs> and, and don't forget that me at 12 years old looked like like a little, like I was, I was a ch- like a super child, like, <laughs> like very prepubescent, like oh very, God. very prepubescent. I got, I've got my hands on my head and I'm just wanting to go, holy shit, what the fuck? Nothing about the story that I'm about to tell you guys is unique to me. Nothing about this is my individual experience in courtship in the IBLP. This Mm. is how it was done. Oh my God. And Sharon and I are going to try really hard to not interrupt you so you can tell your story, but we, we're, we are so sad and horrified. Like we just like, so want to wrap our arms around you and just say this should never happen. So I'm just, I'm just stunned. I am literally sitting here feeling this in my body right now. Mm. And I'm just, I mean, I remember the terror I felt when it was, I was 17 Mm -hmm. and you know, it's like, okay, what do you think of this guy? I remember being terrified at that. I'm putting myself back as a 12 year old and to our listeners, every one of you, Please think back when you were 12 years old, 12 years old. So it, it was just always in my mind. I don't remember a time when it wasn't present in my mind that that was perhaps God's plan for me. Mm -hmm. And there was an enormous amount of grooming both individually for Jonathan, but also daily grooming for being the perfect submissive wife, being the perfect help me, being all of these things. That was daily grooming. I mean, constant daily grooming. And then of course, you know, you're, you're a teenager. So like you're a little boy crazy, right? I mean, that's, those things are still happening. You still have hormones and It was really interesting to hear my brother's perspective recently when we talked after the documentary. Um, My brother was gone by the time it got serious with Jonathan, which was when I was about 15, because he had been kicked out of the house for rebelling. Mm. And so he was not present. So it's been really interesting to visit with him about this story now. I will use his words because it just feels weird for me to say it. But he said, you know, yeah, you were like the Ken and Barbie of Calvary. Mm. There was a pressure as much as I hated my body and I hated my sexuality. I was a very beautiful child. 
And Jonathan was a very beautiful child. And we came from very respected families. And there was a pressure there that is really pretty indescribable to not mess it up. Oh, yeah. Like you're going to be the poster child couple. Absolutely. And you're going to be this showpiece that the church can point to as, isn't this beautiful and wonderful what God has done? Yeah, absolutely. And and we had seen, you know, I always say that we were the guinea pig generation of this whole idea. So there had been two courtships prior to mine that we were positioned to view as wildly successful. You mean in that church before you? Correct. In that church, just two. And I will say their stories are their own stories, and I do not want to presume to tell them. I have since learned as an adult that they were certainly full of hardship and trauma and abuse, but that that was not, I mean, we had no idea. It was, it was the thing, like you wanted it so badly because who were you if you didn't have that? And they looked like shiny, happy people, right? Exactly. And it was so romanticized, this idea of God's perfect person, and he would fill every crevice and every absence of your heart and every longing would be completely and totally filled by this person. It was a guarantee. It was a guarantee. And it was a promise that if you did this, God would fully bless you. Wow. And so as, as, as often happened in courtship, as it turned out much later, by the time we were 15, like we 15. were- 15. Yeah. Hormones were raging. We were obsessed with each other because we had been groomed to be. Right. Then the parents were like, well, you guys can't talk to each other or see each other at all because it was too soon and it wasn't the fulfillment of God's timing. Okay. Did they give you any teaching as far as what God's timing would look like? Were they saying get through high school? Were they giving you any markers? So my parents really wanted us to get through high school, which meant that we could begin a serious courtship at the end of high school. I think, you know, my parents really wanted like 19 or 20. Wait, can I just back up a second? When did it become official that you were like betrothed or matched or was there a specific conversation? So that didn't happen until I was 17. We had this two years of separation, which was, which was brutal. You know, I mean, think back on when you were 15 and the first person that you were puppy loved with, you know, I mean, it, it was to not be able to speak to him or, or converse with him in any way that we would just like be in our little pods of friends looking longingly at each other. I mean, it was oh, horrible. Yeah, that is. So at 12 and 13, they're grooming you for this and you noticing each other. And then they put the brakes on. Yeah. <laughs> is there, did they ever think maybe we shouldn't start this as young as 12 and 13 and maybe let them get older? Because I'm a little confused on why the start, then the breaks. We're all very confused. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is a fair, confusing moment. I'm not sure. I, I don't know if it got away from them. I, I don't actually know how that happened. It, it was, I don't know. It, it's still a mystery to me. Okay, so it's it's part of their messed up plan then, which is something that's come out in other parts of no one really thought this through. They yeah, okay. <laughs> right. It was like what a great idea. And then there wasn't actually a plan <laughs> for what a great idea it was. Oh, yeah. So in that two year kind of separation from fifteen to seventeen, it's very normal in the IBLP and in I think in homeschool in general to graduate early. And I certainly did. Um, He certainly did. So he graduated and went to a fundamental Christian college for a year. And I I worked. So um, I was working full time in animal behavior and as a vet tech, still very much in the faith. And then according to my journals, which is all a little hazy. So journals are super helpful. So according to my journals, it comes out that he is interested in a girl at his fundamental Christian college, which of course was devastating. Mm, Devastating. 
mm-hmm. devastating. Mm. And then at some point. <laughs> now, were you 16 then? 17? 17. 17. I just okay. turned 17. Okay. And then at Christmas, so first semester break, that's kind of when it all came together. His father, he apparently saw me at Christmas and, you know, rekindled whatever. And I was oblivious to this because I was just heartbroken, shattered. And I had had a birthday party, my 17th birthday party, and he came. And apparently that was the day that he went home and talked to his dad. He heard from God. He heard from God on your beautiful birthday. It was certainly nothing about the fact that- I think his cock and balls heard from her beautiful breasts. I, I think that is a hundred percent fact. <laughs> Just an aching sense of God's presence, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> and so his dad communicated with my dad. And then as I understand it, because I was not involved, there was a, a kind of like an interview process that occurred for several months where my father would send inquiries and what is typical in a courtship. And you'll hear this some in the documentary and certainly some, if you've watched the actual Duggars 19 kids and counting the application and a -hmm. common thing to do would be for the father to the father of the girl to email him and want like full thesis on belief systems and are you in the word and how much are you in the word and what has God shown you? And then you're supposed to have this remnant verse about why, why it's that girl. Like God's supposed to give you this remnant verse, oh which my is God. just like a cherry picking <laughs> expedition, but not from the song of Solomon. Cause let's not get too crazy. <laughs> okay. I'm thinking of this application and Abigail, I know, you know, you're in the dog world and, and I'm in the horse world and I breed and you breed. And I'm like, you know, I have a buyer's application. <laughs> oh, me too. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So if somebody wants to buy one of my colts, one of my horses. Yeah, I got a whole lot of information I want to have from you because I do care that my horse gets a good home. But oh. in the end, it's like, yeah, I've got a product to sell. So right. are you the right match? And that's what I'm thinking about this application. <laughs> that is 100% it. I am a product to sell. <sighs> And you, you are really doing it a service to not think of it that way. I mm-hmm. am a perfect virgin mm. and therefore a hugely valuable commodity, both for the kingdom, for my father's status, for the status of the church. I am an enormously valuable commodity. Mm. Holy shit. So... Some courtships are much more extreme than others. Mine was kind of middle of the road. Certainly some courtships require a bride price. Some courtships require all kinds of crazy wait, things. Wait, 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 wait. Bride price. <laughs> yeah. You're like, like, like you hear about in like India and. Yeah, like it's a real thing. Like the dowry. Yeah. I mean, it's, it transcends cultures and time, mainly time. Wait, wait. <laughs> time. Wait, this is, I, I you're, you're kidding. like, what kind of bride price? We're going to break, Sharon. <laughs> we are going to break, Sharon. And so listeners, everyone, I want listeners to just take a step back. Sharon is freaked out who was in an arranged marriage herself. I, I was. <laughs> and- My marriage was arranged, but it was for the glory of Jesus. It wasn't... <laughs> <laughs> And so, yes, hearkening back to what I would say the women before me, a little bit older than me, women's rights, who they were fighting in D.C. for to bring us out of these kinds of dark ages. And then we, as religious people, stepped us right back into it, more so that now we're bringing back bride prices. So continue. Absolutely. And and in my particular situation, that wasn't a factor, but I certainly know of many situations where there was that the boy had to go and work for the, the daughter's father for a period of time to work off her bride price. I mean, those are things that wow. actually happen mm. and not uncommonly, but that was not part of my particular story. You, you are blowing my mind. You are yeah, blowing my mind. It's <laughs> wild. So once the daughter's father is satisfied that this is a godly enough man or has a remnant from Christ or whatever, 
then the, the typical progression, which was the case in my situation, is that you're allowed to write letters back and forth for a period of time, which is usually rather lengthy, like at least six months, pretty typical. And so this was, of course- Can uh, I just with- say rather lengthy six months? When you're thinking about dating and stuff like that, you're going to get married. It's like six months is nothing, but, right. but yeah. you're just writing. <laughs> yes. And you're just writing letters and there's usually like a stipulation on how much you can write. So like we were allowed to send letters once a week. So controlled. And I still have them, which is just mind blowing. And they are some of the most disturbing content I have ever read. So I'm going to describe a sum of the content. Now, I want to be very clear about how these letters pass through because this is so important. Um, this was at the beginning of email. So we were allowed to email. Um, we were, I believe, if I remember the rules correctly, we were allowed to email once a week and we were allowed to write a handwritten letter once a week. But the process was the same. I would write the letter and it would go to my father who would read it and then mail it to Jonathan or email it to Jonathan. Then Jonathan would write a letter or email to my father who would then read it and then send it to me. So your dad was the gatekeeper both ways. Yes. And I want to, that is so vitally important is that this was fully sanctioned in every sense of the word by your umbrella of authority and fully controlled by your umbrella of authority And the content of those letters is so disturbing to me, even now, 20 years later, Hmm. because the content was so groomy and gross. Um, Like there's, there's whole letters talking about everything he thought was wrong with me. So entire letters about everything he wanted me to change for the glory of God you are prideful. <sighs> you are immodest. <laughs> I, I, like first I'm in a stunned silence and now I just want to scream. You're going to get really angry in this story. You're going to get very angry. Okay. And there, there are dozens of them. I mean, this is not like a one, one and done thing. Like there's a, there's a four page email. So like times you Roman 10 point four pages, single spaced email all about modesty and how I am not modest enough and how I am causing both him and others to lust and stumble and how that is completely my responsibility. Oh my God. And grave detail. And And your dad, and your dad sees all this and gives it to you. Correct. (laughs) Correct. And just the detail on those discussions and how sexualized they were in such a broken, disgusting way. And at this time in the emails, it references that he and his best friend took me to the mall to literally look at girls and advertisements to show me how their clothing forced them to connect the dots of nakedness. Okay, I know. Can you explain that? <laughs> it's, it's wild. Like it's it seems like a whole other person. So in this time period of the letter writing, we were allowed to see each other occasionally with chaperones. So his best friend, of course, wasn't a qualified chaperone because boys, but mm-hmm. <laughs> um, his siblings were, which was a huge mistake that we'll get to later. So we were chaperoned at the mall, and I don't remember who the chaperones were, but. But they kind of fall into the background. And who I was at the mall with was Jonathan and his best friend and me. And the entire purpose of the mall trip was to walk me through the mall and point out living human being females who were dressed immodestly. So like, for instance, remember, this is the early 2000s, Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera. So- they would show me a girl that was in a baby doll t-shirt, right? A V-neck with like an inch of midriff showing. And they would say, do you see how we can see the cleft of her breast and then her stomach? And then she has on super tight hip hugger jeans. 
And we are then forced as boys to imagine her naked because all we have to do uh, is fill in the blanks that her clothing is covering. I think he was getting off on that. Oh, oh yeah, no, for sure. God. For sure. This for, is- <laughs> for absolute sure. But and is his purpose with you in this to say why it's so important for you to be modest? Correct. To, oh, because did he... Oh. Because I needed to be perfect and pure and virginal for him. I'm and so also, sorry. I am so, so sorry. I, I just. <laughs> and also, if he looked at pornography or he thought of me in a sexual way, that was my fault because I was, I was not protecting my brother by dressing modestly. Yes, it was. Yes, it was your fault. You should have been wearing a burqa. Which I practically did. <laughs> I was going to say, what would he have been able to point out in your dress? Because I'm sure, you know, like you, know, you talked about your mother being stylish in the other episode and that, that yeah. changing. And I've thought about putting Sharon's and ours pictures in a montage to show the change, <laughs> to show the teenage change. And, and so I know that when you're in this mindset, I can imagine that you would be by all standards very modest at this point. Yes. And it was exhausting for me as an individual because of my body type, nothing was modest enough. Mm. Like not, I was wearing the Holy Trinity of clothing, which was, <laughs> and, and remember I was, I was little bitty. I was a size four. Oh. I had double E cup breasts oh. and a size four. And I was wearing triple X button down shirts from old Navy <laughs> over to the ground denim skirts. Yeah. You know, that was just an exercise in subjugation and shaming. Correct. All that was, was an exercise in making you feel sinful and unworthy and to blame so that you would internalize how bad you are so that he could get away with whatever the fuck he wanted to do. Yes. It was grooming. That's all it was. There's no nice way to put it. It was grooming and it was grooming from the second it started. And that's so important to Mm. remember about these courtships. They are designed to groom submissive wives Mm -hmm. and that you are of Eve and therefore full of sin and shame. Oh, yes. God, you're you're putting this so well. And I just feel like we all have to do what we can to turn the tides of acceptance in the halls of evangelicalism. Like we cannot accept this. And people who know this, we have to speak out. We can't accept this. So thank you. It's so common. Like, yes, my rules of modesty were extreme, but the message is identical to what is being preached to youth groups in almost every evangelical church in this country. Yes, it is. There is a fantastic little satirical video, Christian rap song done by uh, Mega the Podcast. Ooh, you made me feel like that. Yes. It is. We'll put this in the show notes as well. It's all blame the woman. It is blame the woman. You know what? I want to say something else here. I will get into a little bit more, but this system that hypersexualizes women by inflating the value of virginity and purity, mm. it also creates in the boys, it can't do anything but create in them their own hypersexuality because everything, it's yeah. so taboo, it's so taboo, it's so taboo. All that does is it's the scarcity principle. It just makes yes. you want it more. And there is a commonality, not everyone, but a commonality of creating some perversion in the boys that I don't feel expert enough to speak on because I was not a boy in this movement. But there are people who speak about it openly within the IBLP context of not just a hypersexualization of everything, but also a little bit of a sexual perversion tendency in many, many of these boys. Mm-hmm. Maybe that can be another topic we explore yeah. down the road, Abigail. But yeah, I could, yeah, yeah. Continue on with this heartbreaking, angering 
<laughs> frustrating. We're going to skip ahead for a little bit. So, so okay. this goes on this kind of hyper controlled, mostly focused on purity and modesty with occasional time together with chaperones. This goes on for a period of time, eight months, maybe. And I do want to give a trigger warning here for uh, sexual content and sexual assault. At this point, now things are kind of progressing right along, right? We're discussing end game tactics of when is an engagement going to happen? When is a marriage going to happen? And you're putting the cart before the horse constantly, constantly in these courtship relationships. They say it's about getting to know one another with the intention of marriage. But what is actually happening is you're just obsessing over getting married Mm -hmm. and not actually getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. And, And you're never alone. So there's no freedom to be yourself mm-hmm. in its most raw format. Mm-hmm. That makes so much sense. We experienced that when listeners can go back to our four-part purity culture series, but that was these short courtships. Mine was six months and we were so obsessing about staying pure mm. that you absolutely can't build anything else but always fighting that sin of this, Mm -hmm. you know, potential to sin. So I can fully relate to that. And And you're just constantly sinning and confessing and sinning and confessing. It's exhausting. So would you, would you say during this time, I know that was the overriding thing. Did you ever discover, like, we like to do this fun thing together? Was there any time that pressure was off where you could have a chance to know if you even liked him? So not really, no, because you're dating the family. And I very much loved his family, uh, his mother and his brothers in particular. I very much loved them. And that is God's way is if you love his family, then obviously you love him. Mm. But I had so much more freedom with his brothers to know them and to play with them. And, and you know, you're still a child. Like I wanted to play. Mm. So then... <laughs> The, the original sin was made of his siblings being allowed to chaperone us, which which is just a terrible decision in any high control group because there is a back scratching understanding that they are younger than us. Yeah. I was going to ask, are they older or younger? Younger. So if they're good to us, we'll be good to them when it's their turn. Uh-huh. So that's when Jonathan began asking for sexual acts that I did not know the words for. So I was a perfect virgin daughter. I had done everything the way I was supposed to do it, everything. And when he began asking for sexual content using normal terms like blowjob, I didn't know what that was. And so I was working full time and I went to a friend of mine at work who was a stripper when she wasn't a vet tech. (laughs) True story, because I was like, who would know the answer to this question? And in my very sheltered mind, obviously she was the right choice. (laughs) So I went to her and I said, you know, Jonathan is asking for this. I don't know what it is. And she was also very young and told me what it was and how to do it. And so I did because I want to be very- Wait, 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 wait. What did you think when she was describing that to you? Super, super terrified. Oh, yeah. And like terrified, terrified, like made my stomach hurt. Okay. And I have to ask on here too, which you may get into, but in your head, when you heard this, as long as the penis didn't go in the vagina, was it a gray area then? No, as there was as- no gray. Okay. So you knew this would be wrong. Yes. And and I want to be clear on how this was presented and why the grooming in purity culture is so key. This is exactly how it was presented. I, jo- this is Jonathan speaking. I am struggling with staying sexually pure. And if you don't do this, I will sin and it will be your fault. Wait, wasn't getting a blowjob sin? It certainly was, but, but you are so groomed at that point. I'm already going to marry him, right? It's already done. Right. And if he's going to sin. Sin as in rape you? I mean, what other sin would he commit? With another person. Sleep with another person or look at pornography, which of course was like the ultimate sin. 
Okay. Okay. So if I didn't fulfill this sexual need of his, then he was going to look at pornography or get it from a unchristian girl or, or whatever. And it was presented so clearly that way. And when I tell you it was not presented like one day he asked for a blowjob, that's not how that happened. It was tiny, yeah. tiny pieces of grooming over months. Yeah. And then when it was presented that way, I did not want to and did not consent. But I was in my mid-20s before I realized that. And I was in therapy and saying, why am I behaving like a sexual abuse survivor when I have never had sexual abuse? Mm. And my therapist was like, um, excuse me, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, that's not your story. And we need to have a discussion about consent and having enough education to consent right? and yes. having the ability to say no. Because the other half of that whole, if you don't do this, I will sin, is if you tell anyone I asked for this, they won't let you marry me. Oh my God. And they are two sides of the same coin. And it is how these girls in purity culture are groomed to be victims. Yes. They are created to have all of that 100% their responsibility. And if a courtship breaks up towards the end of a courtship, it might as well be a divorce. Mm. You've given your heart away and your heart is dirty and ruined. So you're being both preyed upon and imprisoned. Yes. In this. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that went on for several months. And the way- So wait, the uh, wait. So this wasn't just a one time. This was multiple? No. Yeah, dozens. And the sibling chaperones are leaving you alone in a private place for this in to a happen? Car. Always yeah. in a car. And they would be, you know, like in the McDonald's eating. Okay. Wow. So always in a car. And it was so not consensual. Right. Which is so difficult to describe because the context is so complex. Mm -hmm. No, you're doing a great job. You are, Abigail. And I love and appreciate the detail you're giving because, of course, there's certain elements that Sharon and I can definitely identify with because we came from situations that had some of these tentacles. But coupled with the docuseries, you could see it as people were trying to express, you know, you're being groomed to be a victim. And I think you're definitely adding a lot more color and flavor to this for us to understand how this is happening over, you know, a methodical conditioning. And, and let me just say also, Abigail, thank you. Oh my God. Thank you for your bravery, your courage to be this transparent and vulnerable. Yeah. I think it's such an important thing to talk about. And I think just again, to say, this is not the IBLP. This is not courtship. I cannot begin to tell you how many girls I know that I grew up with in both IBLP, but then also in evangelicalism as a whole that were assaulted this way, exactly this way with this playbook. So when you just said this is not IBLP, what, what do you mean by that? This is purity culture and purity culture and evangelicalism are one in the same. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for saying that because I think we've already heard it from some of the streams of people in our history. Well, this is, you know, a perversion of people going to the extreme. This is sensationalized. This is not happening. And I'm very happy to hear you say that. Also, we have friends as well. It's like this, this has happened. This is happening. This is not some sensational perversion of the teaching. This, like you said, is the playbook. So yeah. It and is. let me also it just state, well, wait, how old were you at this point? 17. So technically, technically, depending on your state's laws, in many states, you are a minor. Yes. And this is actually child sexual assault. Yes. So the way that the courtship ended, 
this is in the very early days of text messages where you start to pay per message. Mm-hmm. His father, who was a dangerous man in himself, which which is probably a whole nother section of a story, but is he was he was a scary person. Found his cell phone where there he had sent an explicit description of what we had done and found it. And they came to my father's home and I got called at work and said, they are here. You need to be here in five Mm -hmm. minutes. And I was five minutes from home. So at work, I left work in the middle of the day, came home and his father broke up with my father in my father's office. And I never spoke to him again. Oh, and of course you were blamed. A hundred percent. It was 100% my fault. I was the Jezebel. I was the problem. And you know, oddly, we had made a contingency plan as many in courtships do um, when they're not going well. So there was an escape plan that was made. And I mean, I'm not talking like a, hey, if this happens, you know, we'll figure it out. No, I'm talking like if our parents find out and they break us up, At 1230 in the middle of the night, you will climb out of this window. My truck will be here. You will get in it. We will drive to Mississippi. We will get married. Like that kind of contingency plan. And he didn't show up. So I was there waiting for the truck to drive to Mississippi to get married. And he didn't show up. And what came out in the weeks and months after that through mutual friends is that he had been seeing many, many girls throughout this entire time. I had to figure out how to get tested for STIs. Fortunately, everything was negative, but I had to figure all of that out having never had a consensual sexual experience. And I do want to be clear that we never had intercourse because that would have been absolutely an unforgivable sin. Mm -hmm. And I would also like to be very clear that every sexual act was me performing on him. There were no reciprocal sexual acts. Oh, Abigail. Hmm. Can I ask if when his dad came to break up with your dad, did any of your dad's natural instincts kick in to try to protect you or say, hey, This is a two-way street here. Not in my recollection. I, in fact, Mm. don't remember my father saying anything. Um, My mother had a pretty significant emotional breakdown, and I didn't speak to her for for many weeks because she she was not in a position to leave her bedroom. You felt the weight of her depression for this? Yes, for sure. Definitely felt completely responsible. What, What happened within the church? Yeah, it was not good. Um, I mean, it spread like wildfire, as most things do in churches. <laughs> yeah. It was it was everywhere. And it was everywhere, and none of it was true. It's not like they even told the bad part of the truth. It was that it wasn't true at all. And then his cheating, or, or whatever you want to call it, was never discussed. And the church turned on me in a heartbeat. I mean, a heartbeat. And I think I went back the very next worship day, which I don't remember if it was a Sunday or a Wednesday, and I did not make it through the whole day I left. Mm. Because no one would speak to me. No one would. All of my friends' parents had told them they weren't allowed to speak to me. And I was completely, completely shunned. And it was enormously public. Like, I mean, enormously public. And your father is not having any conversations. He just walled off his. Yeah. My strong suspicion is that my father was then out of the country immediately after that. That's my okay. guess, but I don't know that for sure. Okay. I don't remember him being there and my mother was ill. So, you know, I drove myself. Oh man. And how long did you continue to stay with that church? Just that one day. <laughs> And I left and, and I didn't go back. Uh, I went back uh, at Christmas for the Christmas cantata because my dad did ask me to go back for the Christmas cantata he was performing and asked me. And I did go back and it was horrible. 
And then I went back one other time several years later when I was engaged to the man that would become my first husband. Wow. When your father asked you to come, was that a hopeful sign that he was wanting you in the midst? Or do you think it was a ploy to get you to come back? Did you have, did you carry the stain of being fallen away? Yes, it was the, the latter. It was the stain of being a rebellious child. And from their perspective in the, in the cult, I had completely left the faith and was in rebellion. Whereas from this, the viewpoint of literally anyone else on the planet, I was still enormously fundamental and deeply, deeply religious. I was attending another church. Mm -hmm. And broken hearted, right? You're broken hearted. Oh, crushed. And that's another thing that's hard to explain is I wrote him letters like every day for a year after Mm -hmm. this happened because that's how groomed you are. You are that groomed. Yeah. Were you apologizing to him and taking responsibility or what? Yeah, it's really interesting to read that journal now. Certainly for the first six months, I was apologizing, groveling, and I never sent them, but I wrote them every day, just what can we do? How can we make this right? I know you're God's plan for me, just utterly incapable of thinking about how to do that without him. Mm. Wow. And then in the last six months, the letters got progressively more angry. And the last letter is enormously angry, just very, very angry. And in that last letter I wrote, he was dating somebody else uh, who would later become his wife. And I wrote in that letter, I said, I hope that one day when you have a child and you're rocking it, you can only think of me, which which I think is possibly true. (laughs) Yeah, it might be. Oh my gosh, Abigail. Well, again, I just want to say thank you for your bravery, your courage, your vulnerability. This is the stuff that people need to hear. This is the reality. This is the reality of what seems like this, oh, isn't that so nice purity and this virgin Mm -hmm. idea. It's like, holy shit, guys, this is so, so awful. It is. We have this theme. We've just finished the four series on purity, cultural virgins, and volcanoes. And I think at times when Sharon and I were talking, we're like, this is such a sad story. Like there's so much, you know, intensity to this that I think when you just hear it from start to finish and then coming into your story, which is, you know, keeping us speechless, which rarely happens. Rarely happens. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) Uh, And the point of this is just that. This is so important to pull the curtain all the way back. It's so important to say this is what's going on in the hearts and the minds of these young girls and these young men. And we who have lived parts of this and Abigail who's lived just the horrific part of this, it's being shared so that we can collectively take a stance. This is not healthy or good. And just thank you, thank you, thank you. And bravo to you for your healing because you can hear it in your story, right? Which allows us to get on and tell these stories. Yeah. I mean, I think these are such important stories and for people to realize that they may have happened in cults, but they happen a lot of places under the guise of biblical teaching, not just in cults. Mm -hmm. That is so true. So true. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, there's more that Abigail is going to share with us. We're going to, I think Sharon put a pin in it. I think that's what Toy and Brian say, which is like borrow from the Aussies, put a pin on it for this one and pick back up next week uh, with another part. How does that sound? Sounds great. You're good to keep going with this, Abigail? Yes, I am. I am ready to do it. (laughs) All right. All right. We will. Abigail, before we sign off, can you tell folks again where they can learn a little bit more about you and what you're doing? Yes, they can find me on TikTok at Unicorn Habitat. And that's where I talk a lot about my experiences in the cult and evangelicalism. There's some quality cult pictures in there. And then (laughs) you can find my nonprofit at the RoverChaseFoundation.org which is uh, providing service dogs to individuals with disabilities. Excellent. 
All right. In the meantime, folks, rate us, write a review, tell your friends. Yes. And check us out on Instagram, feedofclay.cultsisters. We keep everybody updated on the latest episodes and where to find them, along with some cool pictures and photos. (laughs) And stay tuned for more from Abigail. Abigail.